God says in the book of Isaiah, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. A couple of weeks ago, um, we had a couple of guest speakers, and I was scheduled for devotions that Sunday morning. And uh, didn't have devotions then. Henry Beachy had them. And I was going to talk about the glory of God briefly in that devotional. And the more I looked at it, the more I decided I wanted to share a message on it. That verse I just read, and this, is, this next thought is a little bit of an aside to the rest of the message perhaps, but yet I think it is important to consider the fact that the Lord said, I will not give my glory to another. And we shift over to 1 Corinthians 11, where we look about being veiled, the ladies being veiled. It says, For man is indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. So man does not cover his head because he's the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. And so when a, ma- a woman is unveiled, or husband, or leadership, whoever that might be, then is taking glory away from God. And now that's something for you to think about. Go home and think about that a little bit. And maybe that whole concept will become even more serious to you. God does not share his glory with anyone, and that includes man, men who, um, and I think when women are unveiled, takes away God's glory because the man then becomes his glory rather than God's glory. Turn with me to Exodus. I want to go to the Old Testament to lay a little bit of a foundation for the idea of the glory of God. We'll look at some uh, verses in Exodus. We'll look a little bit at the Hebrew words for glory. And then we're going to shift over and look at the temple and the tabernacle a little bit and and then move on into the New Testament where I want the heart of the message to really be this morning. In Exodus chapter 16, and this is not the first place you'll find the word glory in the Bible, but in Exodus chapter 16, there was some murmuring in the wilderness and so forth. And in verses 7 through 10 it says, And in the morning, then you shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we? that ye murmur against us. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to be to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, For he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud, or in the cloud. And you'll see that throughout the book of Exodus. Let's uh, turn over to chapter 19. And I'm not going to read a lot of chapter 19, other than maybe verse 20, where it says, And the Lord came down upon the Mount Sinai, on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And I would have been perhaps um, trembling if I had been him. If you look at Exodus chapter 19, you'll see there that it's at Mount Sinai, and you'll see that what was going on on the mountain, and you'll see the the God saying no one can get close. They were supposed to sanctify themselves, stay away from the mount. The glory of the Lord is going to be there. Don't even let your animals go on the mount. If they do, you need to stone them or shoot them with an arrow. This is God's glory. And I want you to think about that a little bit and compare it to when we get to the New Testament and we think about how we see God's glory today. Here, they needed to stay back. They needed to, to be clear and be away and, and remain away from it. And then, of course, in chapter 20, you see there the giving of the Ten Commandments and so forth. Jump over to chapter 24, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 18. And again, this is Moses and the elders on Mount Sinai. And starting at verse 14, it says, And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again. Uh, unto you, 
And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come to them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days, and the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know about you, but having that, seeing that sight and thinking about that sight, would you have wanted to go into that cloud? I would have probably said, I don't think so. I just, I'll go right back down and I'll just be with the rest of the people. But Moses obeyed God and went in. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not sure what you think about when you really think about the glory of God. <coughs> I do know that as we think about glory and we think about God's majesty and His beauty and honor and His creation and, and the vastness of His creation and what all He has done. And, uh, you know, NASA has this new telescope. I think it's the Webb Telescope. And I saw a picture from that thing. And what looks like stars in that picture, I understand, are uh, galaxies. Thousands of them. And I can't even begin to fathom, really, the size of a galaxy solar system is big enough, and then you think of a galaxy, and then you think of a picture. So God's glory, is just, it's a lot of who God is, and we'll talk about that just a little bit more. But His glory came down on Mount Sinai, and, and there it was. And there was a devouring fire and all this stuff going on, and a mountain quaking and so forth. And we go on <clears throat> to uh, chapter 29 and verse 43. <clears throat> and there it says, when it's talking about the tabernacle, And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And we're going to see a, a verse a little bit later. But the, it was going to be sanctified by the glory of God, the tabernacle was going to be. And we'll, we'll look at some verses a little bit later. Go to chapter 34 right now, and I want to just show you a few verses. And I know we're scooting through this rather quickly. Um, but I want you to notice something here because this is going to be significant later. In chapter 34, starting at verse 29, And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that his skin of his face shone while he talked with them. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. And they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. And just keep that in mind. He veiled his face because of the glory of God. Now we're going to jump on over to chapter 40, and we're going to look at verses 34 through 38. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because of the cloud abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And if you think about this, and you think about what the tabernacle represents, and you think about the church today, and you think about Christ, this is very uh, um, amazing. When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeyings. Now in the Old Testament, there are a couple of words that are translated glory. And they can also be translated uh, honor and uh, other ways as well, worship. 
And this idea of God's glory really connects very closely with our worship. But the one word there is um, kavod. And it basically means splendor, honor, abundance, riches, those types of things. But the root for that is the word um, kavad, which is, so you have kavod, kavad. And that is really the root word for glory, and it's, it's interesting. It means to be heavy or weighty. And when we get to 2 Corinthians, there's a verse that Paul, having an understanding of the Hebrew language, uses the word light and weighty in that. And, and I believe what he's doing there is he's showing the difference between what we're going through in this life and the glory that will come. And we'll see that when we get there. So he grabs on to this idea of this weight or this heaviness. And now you're thinking, well, what, how does weight or heaviness, what does that have to do with God's glory? It's not necessarily as we think about it. It doesn't mean that God is, is heavy in weight or that there's something about glory that weighs us down. <clears throat> but have you ever listened to something or had someone tell you something and you kind of go and you say, weigh and you say, wow, that's, that's some heavy stuff. That's really, that's weighty. It's a little hard to understand. There's some weight to that. Well, you're not saying that it, it's, it's hard to carry, other than maybe it's hard to carry in your mind, but there's some weight to it. That has some weight to it. Someone maybe um, says something or they're whatever, and you, wow, that, that, that really has some weight to it. Or you think of the flip side of that, and you say, well, he's really lighthearted, or that ah, doesn't really matter, there's not much weight to that. So we use those same type of terms today. And so when you think about God's glory, there is heavy, it's heavy, mag, it's magnificent, it's weighty. It's not just something light. And I wonder if we should consider that when we think about our worship to God. It's not a light thing. It's something heavy and something to be considered in that way. And so... That, I think, forms a little bit of a, a foundation as we think about the idea of, of what really is the glory of God and what does worship really look like and who this great God is. Turn now in the Old Testament to Second Chronicles, <clears throat> chapter 7. 2 Chronicles 7, and we are going to read the first four verses there. And this is after the temple has been built, the dedication has happened, and Solomon has this great prayer of dedication. And then in chapter 7, starting at verse 1, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Sometimes we think about God's mercy and we think about the fact, I, I, I don't think we, when we think of God's grace and mercy sometimes, we then begin to think of worship maybe being a little more lighthearted. That, well, God's got grace, God's got mercy, so it doesn't really matter what I do, how I act, how I live, or whatever. I hope you don't ever think that way. Because here, when they saw the glory of the Lord, was when they recognized that His mercy endureth forever, I believe because they recognized if it wouldn't be for God's mercy, when they really saw the glory of the Lord, they saw the fire come down and consume the sacrifices, they recognized that if it was not for God's mercy, they'd all be consumed. And if we don't realize that, we're missing something of God's glory. We're missing it. If we don't recognize that outside of His mercy and His grace, we couldn't, we couldn't stand the glory of the Lord. But when we get to the New Testament, it becomes even more beautiful, I believe, and, and personal to us. 
The sad thing about the glory of the Lord filling Solomon's temple is you move on over into Ezekiel. And I don't think we'll take the time to turn there. But in chapter 10, you'll see where the glory of the Lord leaves the temple. Remember I said that word um, glory has to do with, uh, the, the Hebrew word there is kavod or kavod. You ever heard the word, you know, you've heard the word Ichabod, the glory has departed. Ichabod means to depart, it's gone. The glory is gone. There's no glory left. Now, praise the Lord in chapter 43 of Ezekiel, you'll see a returning of the glory of the Lord, if I understand that. Now, God has glory whether we give him glory or not. God has intrinsic glory. Now, we, the Bible talks about us to praise Him and to give Him glory and honor and worship. But if we don't, it does not take away from His glory. And His glory is intrinsic. For instance, and I'll, Nathan, I'm going to use you here for an example. I hope you don't mind. Um, Nathan is a human being intrinsically. And there's nothing I can do about that. Not that I want to, but there's nothing I can... I could, and this sounds horrible, I could kill Nathan, and you know what? It does not change the fact that he is a human. He would be a physically dead human at that point, but he would still have a human soul and spirit and will forever be a human just because he is a created human being. I cannot do anything about that. I can give him some praise. I can say, Nathan is a good contractor, carpenter, he does a good, great job of building things. I'm giving him some honor, you see. I, I, could stay, I could do that. I could say he's a good song leader. I believe he is. But it doesn't change the fact that he is a human being. I can, I can praise God, and I, can, and I need to. We need to give glory to God, but it does not change the fact that God is God, and he intrinsically has glory Turn with me now to 2 Corinthians. And this is where I believe this idea of God's glory becomes, dare I say, more exciting and um, should make us all sit up and take note. So we're going to spend a little time here in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4. so that you can grab the context of what we're looking at. And Paul here is talking a little bit, when he begins chapter 3, he's basically talking about, you know, do we commend ourselves, do we give, or, you know, so forth, and, and he's talking a little bit about himself. But look how he moves along here. He says, in, starting at chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, verse 1, do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, Epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you. Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, thinking back about the, the law, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such... And such trust we have through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death... Now, okay, now here he's talking about... He's going to start using the word glory here. Think about the fact that he's talking about the law compared to the new covenant in Christ Jesus. Think about this now. He's going to start comparing this. Um, in verse 7, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, and it was, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Okay, he's talking there about the fact that Moses, remember he had to put a veil over his face, it was so glorious they couldn't look upon him, and yet that glory was going to be put away from the, from the Old Testament, the law. He says, if that was glorious, think about it. Verse 8, 
How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, the law, how much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in joy, the fact that we are now justified? For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. In other words, the Old Testament, the glory of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the law, doesn't even compare to the glory which is in Christ Jesus. He said if that, if that was glory, he said, let's just look at that, word, that verse again. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect or in comparison to the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away with was glorious, how much more, or much more, that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness, or that word there could be interpreted, boldness of speech. And not as Moses, notice again, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Notice he's using the word glory and veil back and forth here. So the veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. I'm going to stop there and just... That word there, a veil, is kaluma, or it has to do with the same word. It's in 1 Corinthians 11, catacalupto. It's from that same root word. It's, it's veil, something that's hanging down. I'm going to mention a couple of other words here later. So the veil is still on their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, when, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, these two verses here, so I really want us to dig in. Now, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom. In other words, freedom from the law. That's the context here. It's not freedom to do whatever you want. It is freedom from the law. But look at verse 18. But we all with open face. And that word open there means anna. Catalupto. Anna means none. Unveiled. That's what that word means. Open. It's, it's unveiled. It's saying the veil is going to be taken. But we with unveiled face, we don't have the veil on us anymore, the, on our face. Beholding as in a glass or in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That word change is that word that's often used there, uh, metamorphosis or something that, like the, you know, the, the uh, caterpillar turns into the butterfly. You see that? We don't have to put a veil over our face anymore. It says, as in a mirror we behold... Jesus Christ, the face of Jesus Christ. Look at that, the glory of the Lord. Beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We don't have to shake and quake and, and run from the glory of the Lord like they did in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is now the glory of the Lord. You see, the scripture says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You can't see God. God is a spirit. You want to see God, you look at his son, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, it was the glory of the Lord came down, and, and people stood back, and, and when Moses was there in the glory of the Lord, people couldn't look at him because of his face, and so he had to put a veil over it. Today, we take the veil is off, and we see Jesus Christ, and there's the glory of the Lord. But what's even more I guess to me, impressive about this verse is, it says we look in the mirror and we see the glory of the Lord, and then it says we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 
if your image isn't changing to become more like the image of Jesus Christ, which holds the glory of God. Now, I'm not saying we take away God's glory. That's not what I'm talking about. But there is a sense in which we can look into that mirror of Jesus Christ and you know how it is. You, you look in a mirror and you know, when you get to my age, there's not as much you can do. But when you're younger, you look in a mirror and you see things that aren't quite right and things that can be a little tweaked and a little fixed. I mean, you know, you can't do a completely complete makeover. Some people try it. It makes it a little worse. But you can look in a mirror and you see an image and you're like, I need to change some things here. And you fix things. As, as believers, we can look in the mirror and see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and see where we don't line up. And by the Spirit of the Lord, He changes us if we allow Him so that we become more and more like the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That glory changes us. We don't run from it. Rather, we look and we see and we are changed. We are transformed. It says we are metamorphosed, basically, from that caterpillar into that butterfly over time. As we look into that mirror and we see the true glory of the Lord. We're going to go on into chapter 4. Therefore, okay? Therefore, because of that, Seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things. So here, you want to see how it's changing us? Look, it, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, and that word hid there goes right back to that same um, word that means veil it's interesting how we see that word used if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to them that are lost not only can we look into the glory of God and it's we don't have to have a veiled face <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus Christ by our lives needs to be unveiled so that the lost can see it However, that does have to do with their hearts. Let's go on. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see what he's done? God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. We are, we are taken out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light. And out of that light, it says, the knowledge of the glory of God is to shine. <clears throat> but it says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Yeah, we're still in our bodies, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It is the working of the Holy Spirit that shows that glory, not us. Because we're here still in these bodies. But we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest or obvious in our body. We want people to see Christ in our body, the glory of the Lord. For we, live, um, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death work in us, in us, but life in you, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all, things are <clears throat> for all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound or contribute. And this is interesting. Think about it. 
All things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. We're to give God glory. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And here's the verse where he compares light affliction with the glory of God. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see how he used that idea of light and weight? Because he understands what the Hebrew word means there for God's glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And when he goes into the next chapter, is where he says that he says he would, um, he would rather to be home with the Lord, because that's when we are absent. When we're absent from the body, we are home with the Lord, fully experiencing the glory of God. Turn with me to 1 John. I can't quite tell if the glory of God is exciting you as much as it is me or if you're thinking about your taters in the crock pot or not. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just not, ex- maybe I'm just not sharing it quite right. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him and see him as he is. And we can look at him now in that mirror, that glory in a mirror, and see it now even. And every man that hath this hope in him, what does he do? Purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And I want to turn to Revelation chapter 21 as we think about the glory of God and what will yet be revealed and what we have to look forward to, but what we can, what we can already see in that mirror, as we look at and behold the glory of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 21, when it's talking about the new heaven and a new earth, we're going to look at verses 22 and 23. He says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your great glory. Thank you that you have shared your glory with us through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you can transform us from glory to glory. That we can behold you and that your glory will be with us throughout all eternity. Lord, I pray that somehow in our worship we will understand that a little bit. Lord, I just pray that your spirit would change us. Lord, I pray too that our lives would not veil the glorious gospel to others. Help us, Lord, to show your glory to those around us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen.